and welcome to the Daft Souls podcast. And this time we've got a bit of a special for you. I'm joined by Mr. Chris Bratt. Hello. In the last podcast that I did with Daft Souls, you may have noticed that I said, oh, is this the one where we talk about that live? And then stopped. This is because this is what this one is this going is to be about. And I got is. confused. You got confused. We brought brought back gay teams. So it's Mr. Chris Bratt and... Mr. Quentin Smith. Hello, am I B A Baracus? That's problematic. I'm, I'm, I'm literally the first thing I say. I don't the think podcast. there's anything problematic about you being B A Baracus. Yes. Just as long as you don't dress up as him. But in spirit, it's fine. I anyway. was the I was the the tough military commander of the game. We're going to talk about what game we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Watch the Skies. Now, Watch the Skies. For those who don't know, Watch the Skies is if you imagine to yourself for one one beautiful moment that XCOM. Is not a video game, but it is it's a way an, of life. I've an actual it. real world thing, and there are actual aliens coming and actual people on the planet trying to deal with that. Then that's sort of what we did. Watch the Skies is basically it's known as a mega game, and it's a game which lots of people all play out at once. So you've got a group of people who are the aliens, and they're dealing with what the aliens Ooh. do, and then you've got a group of people who are also. The, the humans. Yay! And we did this... Uh... Dude, I'm pretty sure the aliens were nicer than the humans in our game. Yeah, yeah. I think the easiest touchstone for everybody is a model UN. It's an awful lot of... Dis- it's a game with an awful lot of discussion, but then a model UN crossed with XCOM where every player is also monitoring your exact PR level, your exact income, your exact military units. Yeah. So you've got like kind of traditional game systems going on within it, but then it is basically kind of like political role playing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we, if you want to get a feel for what this is like, actually, the best way to do it is if you go on to Shut Sit Down. Well, the first one we did, just give, give you a real taster, was Watch the Skies. And there was, I think it was called Shut Up Sit Down, play a goddamn mega game. Yeah, that was a 40-minute video. That was a 40-minute video. I think there were like 70 people playing that yeah. game. It's quite a small game, relatively. <laughs> uh, even though at the time it ended up being the most intense and stressful thing I've ever done. Um, but that was the first time that I was the Prime Minister of Japan. How However, recently we played Watch the Skies 2, which really ramped it up. And that was with, well, I don't know how many people I, there, but it I felt like about... over 300. Yeah. The, the chips I think there were about 300 people there. So and if, it was crazy. If I can just outline some background here, it was because we did that video on the first Watch the Skies that actually these things are now being run all over the world. Yeah. There are mega games happening in Canada and America and all kinds of branches of this UK mega game making society doing these mad little model UNs and war games. Um, all over the world. So kind of spurring on from the massive press that Watch This Guys has got, Jim tried to do the biggest mega game ever. So when we say there are more than 300 players, we're talking, there were like about 40 players who are what's called controls, who are kind of like games masters. They're the people who relay all the information from players. They're kind of like the DM in, in yeah. Dungeons and & Dragons. Then we had, what, nine people playing just the media outlets. They were... They were there was two of them as well. At two, least to start with. Oh, no, two papers to start with. I don't know. And then I think they were... And they had to publish newspapers and yeah, stories and, and talk to players. There were people playing corporations. Three there were. Pa- the Pope was not just represented by a player, but there were three players... One of whom was the Pope, one was a papal envoy, and the third was, I don't even know. I think the Pope had a cup, more like three papal envoys. Maybe they didn't all Man, get... there's shit you don't know about the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, that guy was out to so yeah, kind of just to, for the fun of a bit of background, yeah, we, we carried on being Japan again. It was a different alien invasion with loads more aliens, loads more complications to the world and how the world works. But also um, there was, yeah, we were actually double filming it. So Brat had a unique experience. Mm. I this. actually... Literally saw behind the curtain. They kept the aliens behind the curtain. Also, very important to point out, in this game, which was just because of the scale of it was different than the last one you played, the looks of it, they were on a, a, a balcony above this big hall that, that the humans were playing in. So the aliens were literally above the rest of the game, looking down yeah. through this curtain. <laughs> that was a wonderful reveal, actually, when they kind oh, of yeah. opened up the curtains and there were all these aliens mm-hmm. stood up there. And you're like, oh, okay, that's the enemy. Yeah, so so I I could have run around primarily focusing on you guys, but also getting to chat to other people doing other stuff. You became with, quite with fixated the on the Pope, yeah. I wouldn't <laughs> tell you what was going on. Oh, the 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 Pope. I don't know if we need to get into that this straight away because I'm, I'm going to derail you. The, so the Pope badly. will the Pope's exploits are uh, will be tasked in the video. Yeah, I we wish we should say that this will give you kind of a light overlay over kind of like idea of what 
Mega Games are what Watch the Skies 2 is like. Um, but yeah, already on the site, you can actually watch the whole thing. Uh, so if you go shut up and sit down and look for Watch the Skies. Yeah, we'll get a nice it. link right in the We'll get a link in the podcast link description as well. So if at this point you're kind of thinking, oh, actually, I don't want to, I want to actually see this, get a feel for it, do watch the video. And me do watch it anyway, because I honestly think it's going to be pretty It's going to be a hell of a something. thing. <laughs> so that, now we've given the outline of the game, let's talk about just what Japan was. The nation of Japan was our team, and that was seven people. So, Matt, you were the Prime Minister of Japan. I was the Prime Minister of Japan. It's, very, it's always a very Japanese name, Mr. Matthew Lees. It is indeed. Uh, I was the, the... Oh, I don't know if we get this right. The general... No, the, oh, the something of the Japanese Self-Defense Force. I just, have an army. I just, knew you, force. I just knew you as being, like, the military guy <laughs> that walked around with... <laughs> Well, the aviators... They know, weren't aviators. Glasses. They really weren't. They were the they only were cool sunglasses. sunglasses. Yeah. I went to my house, and I was like, you got some sunglasses, and she gave me the coolest pair. Uh, they had, like, gold tinting. I, I felt like I looked like Sai, you know, I was in Gangnam You did style. a bit look like... Again, problematic. Uh, but, um, <laughs> so then I had uh, Theodora, who was the sort of deputy military deputy. aide. I did. Gosh, we, had a, uh, we had an ambassador. That was uh-huh. Casa McDonald, also on Darth Souls. We had Paul Dean. Uh, he was our... A pure scientist, yep. head, head of pure science, which is just knowledge of space and electronics and all this stuff. Then uh, our friend Ian, uh, who was actually the translator on Dark Souls 2, a part of the team that did the translation of Dark Souls, he was applied science. So actually the result, his job was turning this stuff into inventions we could use. And finally we had Brendan... Foreign minister. Yeah, the foreign, foreign minister. He was a foreign minister. He was. So these seven people ostensibly worked together to run a country... But there were like what forty countries represented. So just imagine the chaos. You guys know that Brendan was like stealing money, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, good. Yeah, we found out about that. Yeah, at the end when he basically just sort of said, "Look, I've been, I've been st- st- embezzling. embezzling money. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought it would be useful for me, but it wasn't." I got <laughs> genuinely annoyed at the, the kind of lack of team spirit. I was working so hard <laughs> to uh, to to keep our borders secure, to worry about who the aliens are. I was really getting into my role. I was exhausted. And then, so what? Brandon was embezzling money. Mm-hmm. Paul had a book deal yeah. and was angling for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Ian, head of applied science, went for a burrito. <laughs> and when he, he, he couldn't, he couldn't find him for like an hour and a half, and when he or an hour, and when he came back, there was an asteroid heading for the Earth. <laughs> did, he go, did he go to Benito's hat? Yeah. Oh, jealous. I mean, I went later that day, but <laughs> I had such a good experience there that I'm jealous in retrospect of anyone who was there in the day. Because I was hungry, man. It was all cups of tea and madness. You didn't go there. You didn't leave the game. You were the Prime Minister. No, I didn't. No, good. I didn't leave the game all day. Well, that's the interesting thing is it's like it ends up being a bit like a role playing game, but but almost like I've been trying to work out how best to describe this, but it feels like with LARPing and stuff, it comes a bit more from a, I don't know, a different angle, a bit more of a like fantasy role playing angle rather than with the intention of creating theatre. It is a bit more like pretending to be a like a knight or pretending to be an orc when you're, or whatever in LARPing. Whereas with this, it felt very much like you weren't pretending to be anything so much, but you were very much like pretending to play a role within a big kind of... It's really hard to describe, think, but it, it felt like a massive... UN's like a pretty decent point of reference. Like. But it, it was the idea of like Model UN, but it's just so much more chaotic. And it was the fact that like all I was in charge of was like the money, the GDP of Japan, yep. which is pretty damn hot, i got to say. But... Uh, and then everybody's <laughs> just coming to me and telling me things and asking me questions. And I think the final piece of the puzzle that's missing is it's a model UN on a timer with 300 people because there was a massive projector showing what phase we were in, which mm-hmm. results in this the exhausting turnover of the game where, okay, it's phase one. I, as the military guy, needed to have my budget and I needed to have my units, which were toys, like literally painted like planes that you play with. But I wasn't laughing because I had to be by the map. I had to have them deployed. I had to have them paid for. And then it's onto phase two, which is where, you know, like, and then phase three, four, five, six, seven, then it's back to phase one. Mm. And it's this exhausting pace where information is the main currency. And I think, like, there were all kinds of things that did that from a game design perspective, which so rarely are dealt with in video games. But information being a currency and being the most valuable currency, I think, for me, is the most yeah. interesting thing. I think you're right. And I think that there's the, also the fact, I guess, with Model UN, the whole point of the game is that, like, oh, um, this is a problem you have to deal with and then you'll have to like deal with it together. Whereas yeah. we had a, a wider problem here. Aliens are here. That's a problem, isn't it? Probably. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but but in between on the day-to-day, like we didn't 
know what we were doing. And it's the problem of being like, you have to set your own objectives up, like find out what's happening in Africa. How do we do that? Well, like, well, Clint you go and talk to these people, you go and talk to these people, you go and talk to these people, like, and then also in between this, so you're trying to deal with your objectives yeah. of getting the information you want. Meanwhile, you've got other people coming and bothering you because you've got information that they want, maybe. Oh, God. But then you've got, like, corporations bothering you to try and set up ongoing deals w- because they're trying to make money out of it. I was saying this in the pub on the day after, but the fu- I realised halfway through the day that, you know, as the Prime Minister, you needed to be the linchpin who understood everything everyone on the team was doing. So I got really aggressive and, like rude when I saw you talking to and later on we found out of course you did need to be talking to the head of corporations oh yeah yeah and you did need to be talking to like Venezuela or whatever but I at some point would come up and go what the hell are you doing what are you doing yeah. well, sometimes he doesn't have time actually that was a beautiful moment that I didn't tell you about which was you were talking to someone it was just after it was after the Tokyo incident and uh, and someone came up and it was like who are you and it was he was the, I don't know the war minister of France He's like, I'd like to talk to your Prime Minister. And it felt so good to, for the first time in the day, say, he doesn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the guy was like, okay, and walked off. And I felt like that's how we should have been playing yeah. it the entire game. It, from from uh, filming everyone on the team and spending time with, with each member doing their different things, it becomes really clear that um, Watch the Skies isn't one game. It's like loads of weird mini games that overlap at certain points. Yeah. And like, so I was uh, throughout the day just bemused and joyous about the science minigame, uh, which, um, <laughs> mainly because Paul was, was hilarious throughout the whole thing. Like, you guys were dealing with... You knew you knew that there was an alien incursion of some sort was happening and you had, uh, you know, some difficult relationships with other countries to worry about. Paul was just like, in their room, they had a separate room where they went for science conferences once a turn. That almost immediately became this weird thing where the pure scientists got all high and mighty and banned the applied scientists <laughs> from coming to the same conferences that they go to because they weren't, you know, of, of the high enough level to talk their, their sort of uh, To talk work. about the same science, yeah. Yeah, even though the applied scientists are actually the ones that really get a lot of the work done. I think- and, they, they, like, Paul, Paul's turns, really, uh, at least to start with, were, like, writing papers or, like... Write, Literally writing papers yeah, as well. about pretend science and then, like, just selling it to the rest of these pure scientists who would either, like, nod and go, oh, yes, very, very good, <laughs> or someone would heckle him in the background and then they'd argue. And you guys were outside, like... An asteroid was coming towards the planet, which is... You know, I can laugh about... Actually, yeah, and I should tell this story because I'm sure it'll make it into the video, but there was a point where I got handed a leaflet from the UN (laughs) saying, oh, there's an asteroid going to hit the Earth. And I saw it. You can't leave the military table once you're there. If you do, you can't come back. So I waited, you know, waited to make sure China wasn't dicking around in our airspace again. Then I go to Paul and it's like, Paul, what are you doing? And it's like you were saying, yeah, Paul was having this joyous time. So he didn't, he wasn't experiencing the same stress as me. He was experiencing the day radically differently. So when I said, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm discrediting my nemesis. He was writing, writing a paper. paper to discredit and another I scientist. honestly snatched it out of his hand, <laughs> gave him the asteroid leaflet and said, deal with this. And Paul really, for his game, his stupid, literally stupid yeah. game, he needed that paper I stole. But for me, it was he, actual nonsense. Like, he he didn't concentrate on the asteroid immediately as well, because I was following around after that, because I was just fascinated <laughs> by this paper that he's writing about this one of the German players. And he was like, he was he was getting to the stage where he was going to try and steal it back from you. Like it was, <laughs> it was, and how petty is that? Whereas <laughs> I just needed him to focus. We also found out um, we were lagging behind in science for the entire game, partially because he went for a burrito, but also because Paul had a dead alien. Because you need alien tech to spike your way up the tech tree. And Paul had a dead alien, and Ian didn't know, because Paul just wasn't communicating, because he (laughs) so didn't care. And there was a point, I was in that conversation where I said, Ian, what have we got? And Ian's like, oh, we don't have anything. I mean, we've got this cool thing, but we need a dead alien for it. And Paul... Like, as if it just occurred to him, said, oh, I've got an alien, and produces the card from his pocket, <laughs> and Ian was just he had, he literally dumbfounded. had a dead alien in his pocket. <laughs> he did, yeah. That also, the, the pocket thing is so funny, because all the material in the game is like, whether it's scientific artifacts or money, and yeah. stuff, they're just flimsy cards. Yeah. So, who, Paul, the most I, I saw... I kept losing my money, I kept being... Like, <laughs> but, uh, the funny thing was... Uh, oh, well, let me, let me oh, just... Because yeah, okay. the most I saw Paul laugh in the whole day, which was, was um, there was a scientist selling something... But the control was next to him. And so he's like, we're selling the cure for cancer in five, four, 
three. And someone was like, we need a megabuck. Who has a megabuck? And I bolted over, because again, competitive. <laughs> and started going through my pockets like a man possessed. Like, <laughs> my phone, my phone must be on here. But I was just looking for one dollar, because I swear I had one megabuck on me. <laughs> and Paul was just crying with laughter. I just found it funny that, because our, our GDP was quite strong, like I didn't have to be too careful with the budget. I, it kept just being a case of being <laughs> yeah. like people at the start of each term, which was supposed to be three months, everybody would just come to me and say, oh, I need this much money. And you'd be like, oh, I need three, three billion. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I'll just give you them. Like, And often I'd just give you more because I don't have change, but I'll have five. <laughs> um, but it meant that, yeah, again, like as a way of not dealing with people, like, I'd set up all these arrangements with corporations that I didn't even really understand. <laughs> and like just periodically throughout the day, and it was that thing of like, you were quite right when you were like, what are you doing talking to these people? We have more important things to deal with. And it was like, a lot of the time I knew, but I had to talk to them because I'd like end up like, getting myself into a real pickle with like, financial agreements but more often than not it just means these guys these, these they were shysters they were full on shysters I mean, role they, playing it they were role playing shysters was a, I would love to have that role because it was the hilarious thing of like I'd see you talking to them and I'd see that because they the thing is when a human being comes up to you and starts talking to you in a game of communication your, in, your impulse your instinct is like to talk that like okay this is as good of a use of my time but it's categorically not by the end of the day we figured out we needed you talking to the president of the United States all the time. But this is the funny thing about a game where information is the highest commodity. You have to realize that some people who will be really earnestly talking to you and trying to tell you things are not worth your time. Like, I realized as well that I had a communication with like the military attache of like Venezuela. And we were like, oh man, we need to know more things. Let's trade information. I was like, cool. I think only after we finished playing the game, I realized that was so dumb because it meant once a turn, I was spending 10 minutes with this guy who I didn't know from Adam and who was giving me information, which actually isn't like a positive thing because he would talk for me to 10 minutes, for 10 minutes, whether he knew stuff or not. And he was trying to sound big. So he was, if he heard the tiniest rumor, he was just telling me like it, as verboten, which was actually making my game harder, not yeah. easier. That was a big thing I noticed as well, as it came that you'd either get like smaller countries coming up to you and go, oh, we, we, by the way, we know this. And you go, yeah, no, we, we've known about that for ages. Like, uh, or like, you know, it would give you useless information that was like red herrings just because they wanted to be maintain that relevance. And it must have been actually a completely different game if you were role-playing as one of the smaller, less important countries. Because, yeah. hey, you'd have a budget you'd actually have to worry about. You'd have, like, not much money, <laughs> rather than just being like, I had these shysters come up to me and just going, oh, you need to give me one million, well, a mega buck. And I just be like, yeah, just, just <laughs> I'd just be giving them money to go away. Do you guys have any idea what, I don't know, what, what the end game was for these corporations? Was it yeah, just to be more to... successful than the competitors? I, I think it was complicated because even within the corporation there was politics because... Um, you have the head of research, the person who runs the company, and then someone who was brokering deals. And I think even within that, some of them had different roles. There was an interesting thing that when we talked, when we first did the Mega Game uh, last year, um, and we talked to the designers of it, mm. um, we said, we, what we found really interesting was all the politics. And then we talked to them and they said, oh yeah, we've, all, we've run all kinds of games in World War One, for example. And everyone's part of the same trench warfare network. And I said, um, you know, like, how on earth is that political? How could it be political? And they were saying, no, politics is just endemic as soon as humans are working because even you, just the officer at the front line, you have seven men underneath you. That's still political because you'll be looking after those seven men, which means you end up lying up the chain of the command. And if you're next to someone who's a glory hound, then you'll try and suppress their communications with their officer <laughs> and just all of this stuff. Like, So I think even within the corporation, even with the objective of just making money, there's room for personal vendettas and, yep. and misinformation. And yeah. All kinds of. It was just amazing. Stuff. I remember the the guy who was like, like always, like he was just like properly sucking up to me. The oh, whole he was time. so the guy in the three piece suit. And uh, no, not him. He was just he was great as well. But this guy, <laughs> the guy right at the start, he was like, "You're going to be preferred customers and stuff." And I just remember at one point he came over trying to sell us a deal which involved us like having a military factory based in Japan. Yeah, and I was yeah, like, yeah. I was like. Ah, uh, we're not really like building any army stuff at the moment. We're not really like looking to expand our arms. And it was this thing of him just immediately just like wandering off because it was the thing of just being like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, time like no, it was it was sort of a deal that involved like us getting a discount on more military stuff. But I think their company ended up being they it, were the they won the award for like most corrupt. It never happened because I think it was like it, it never really 
panned out. We didn't know about it because it happened right at the end of the game. But I think that they'd gone so heavily into making military stuff. That oh, that was that was then, a, that was another corporation. They, that was oh, another. another corporation had invested so heavily in military equipment that they then couldn't sell. That they decided to then use it as a private military to try and have a, a forceful takeover of another company. No, it wasn't it. Oh yeah, that's no. one company did that. But there was loads of stuff happening. There was like. something else where again that same company I think invested so heavily into the military they were giving it to people to try and create wars to sell stuff and it's funny that that happened not just like because that's what happens in the real world but the simulation was just granular enough that we were seeing things that really do happen mm. in real life yeah where companies are invested in wars continuing because that's where all of their jobs come it's from. mad I love it basically the, you know the way these games work is there is a scenario set up there is like a kind of general set of rules which should naturally mean that the game gravitates towards one sort of resolution but then there's all sorts of little interesting curveballs in there and all sorts of interesting bits of information that may or may not be unlocked if the player's go down that angle yep. and some stuff which is just like set to like you know like a jack in a box of being like after a certain amount of time this will happen which will lead them towards it but then and that the real madness comes from the fact that then you can be these people who can go to the people who are in control and say can we do this and they'll go yeah <laughs> yeah. and then it means that I mean when the, the day ended like it ended at the right point partly because we were all absolutely shattered I don't think we could have played another 40 minutes I've never been so tired in my life and when I try and say that to people people like almost roll their eyes of being like come on you're just playing a game all day it's like no it's the most exhausting thing in the world Yeah. Um, but it is just it is the equivalent of just like pushing a rickety cart down a hill and then the game sort of ends just before it crashes into a wall. <laughs> like, at the point at which it ends, everything is unfathomably exciting, but also like you could just mad. Yeah. Another turn and everything would collapse. Yeah. Like because yeah, you more yes. The thing that was crazy that we didn't realize as well is um, the first time we played Watch the Skies when they did this aliens attacking the you the the world mega game. All the aliens had uh, they were designed in terms of how they interact with the world. Between then and this sequel that we played, um, Jim, the designer, made a entirely alien-focused mega game with a little galaxy and all kinds of crazy super future tech. And what we played was the result of them bolting that alien yeah. galaxy game onto our game where the planet Earth just happened to be relevant to all the species at that point, which meant the aliens were just totally inscrutable. We had mm -hmm. no idea what they were doing because their activities were the result of stimuli not from the planet earth it's like oh they didn't land this turn then we must have done something good last turn yeah and appease them but actually it's because no they were dealing with a political thing in like cylon doing yeah, something 47 else. b there, there were six separate uh like playable alien factions it, like i i remember when you guys first tried to contact them at one point i followed a secret message up there and you wrote it assuming that the aliens were a single united front and that if you wrote a message to Dear aliens, like, <laughs> it would get to, you know, leader of the aliens. And I followed it, and that's what I expected. I didn't realise either. And it was given to a single faction within that, which had its own goals that were completely separate to the yeah. other alien factions. Not all of them got along. They definitely were striving towards different things. And it, t it you didn't discover that until much later in the game, which was brilliant, because you were freaking out about, um, like, oh, God, if we shoot down this UFO here, it's going to scupper the relationship completely. But that wasn't necessarily the same... Faction. It was, the, people, it was yeah. the worst puzzle to be faced with as a military commander because it meant <laughs> yes. UFOs were landing and they could have been from six different factions with six different attitudes and I didn't know that, which meant I was trying to, like the cause and effect of do we shoot it or not shoot it and then what happens next, not knowing that there were actually six different kinds of UFOs landing that I just had no idea about. Yeah, it's, I, I think what was fascinating though for me was the fact that we didn't, even vaguely think about that like when yeah. everything was happening it was like why are the aliens here what do they want and it was just very hugely human. it's very human that's very it, human that's but we hugely have... egocentric yeah. in the fact that it's like all we were thinking about is it, this is all about us mm -hmm. forgetting the fact that in real life if there's an alien invasion these aliens have come from somewhere else to our planet, right? If they can do that, they've probably got loads of stuff going on. Like they've, probably got, <laughs> they've probably got a lot on their plate. The idea that like their entire focus of their civilization is all about us is just such a human, stupid thing. And I saw this then when I realized this, how dumb it was that we like, 
everything in our minds everything had to be about us and what was happening now mm -hmm. and yet even on a smaller level that was kind of what the game reflected to me all day of being like we we were so aware in just Japan our seven the team of seven how fragmented and confused and all over the place we were and yet whenever anything else happened with another country we were always looking for really black and white reasons for yeah. why it was forgetting that actually within our own world like there were so many reasons and stuff going on and it was that thing of, of Quinn saying that you stop talking to somebody because you realise it's not maybe not worth your time anymore and that can be so damaging if you build a relationship with the president talk to I talked to the president of the United States for a little while then wandered off didn't talk to him for like maybe an hour and a half and in that time just something else somebody else had told him and it's just completely soured to us and like, <laughs> and like we completely fixed it in a chat but again like the best thing I uh, I discovered in terms of just figuring out how to glom information from this mess of people and egos and, agen and agendas was um, going to desperate people. And I was so proud of myself when I figured this out. But there were certain African nations that were having a real problem and their PR levels, which is where your income comes from, like approval ratings like an XCOM, their PR ratings were dropping because of just abductions and they couldn't keep the UFOs out of their skies. And I went to the, uh, to the uh, president and it was so funny because it was you couldn't have written it in a film. Like the president of one of these African nations, I think it was South Africa, was like in a suit that was really big and really heavy and like tied up to the neck and he was just sweating so much. <laughs> and it was like, it looked like a joke because he was nervous. It's like, oh, which one's the president of South Africa? Oh, it's the nervous looking one. <laughs> but people who were suffering and panicking and in a really bad way would tell the truth. Like, if you said we need information, because they didn't care. They weren't playing some grand yeah, political yeah. game. They're like, I care about keeping people alive. I'll tell you whatever you need to know. Rather than the whole... I'll tell you a thing if you tell me a thing if you tell me a thing. It was actually really thing. fascinating, yeah, that all of the characters who were playing powerful countries, all of the major countries like America, Russia, China, that whenever you tried to go and have chats with them, everyone, because they knew that knowledge was power and they were relatively safe, everyone was incredibly evasive. No one would answer, answer questions because it felt like these were huge bargaining chips. And, yeah, you go to lots of the smaller countries with less to less to lose <laughs> and you could make huge progress really quickly but it is it was amazing like the how you sort of feel like in a real world scenario it made me realize how dumb XCOM is as a yeah. concept the idea that like you know we were in a, we were in a room with like all the world leaders and it took hours before the world leaders were happy to just openly share what was going on from their perspective mm -hmm. without people freaking out. The idea that if aliens turned up, all of the big nations of the world would, would happily fund one. <laughs> like, it's, it's laughable. <laughs> yeah. What you get is you get the American XCOM project and then yeah. you get like, and it would be a mess. Everyone would have their own project and none of them would communicate. Nobody would share tech and everyone would die. The biggest problem with figuring out what the aliens were doing as well is like basically, as following up from what you're saying, the UFOs in the sky were just pinatas because they're full of all this incredible space age tech. So yeah. you've got a game which starts with pinatas in the sky and you have these interceptors that shoot them down. And if you can shoot them down, the tech you get will just skyrocket your country into just billions and global superpowers. That's the thing, is it? You said country, but you want, like, this is individual countries will want that pinata. Well, yeah, this than is another the thing. country thing. So all we wanted, to, all I really wanted to humans. do, I, 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 the superhuman effort I put into, like, I wanted to know what happened if we just let a UFO land because mm. we weren't finding out. And I had a feeling that talking to the aliens and forging communications would be more useful than like whatever one piece but of tech we get. But any time any UFO came into your airspace and you didn't immediately try and shoot it down, Suspicion. everybody else in the world <laughs> suddenly looks at you with razor eyes if yeah. to go, oh my God, they're one of them. Yeah, it's so dark. And so like the aliens immediately get painted in this tyrannical thing because everyone shoots them down because... They're aliens and they're, they're abducting things. And also because there's good tech involved. So when you don't shoot them down, you stand out for two reasons. One, you appear magnanimous, which means you make all the other countries look bad for being, for being sky murderers. Yeah. And it also means that you're, you're working with the bad guys. I tell you who didn't shoot down the aliens. Who Fucking didn't? Pope. He, he let them land straight on the Vatican. Well, the Pope doesn't have any fighter jets. Well, he let them. He no, let I them. remember this now. We were talking to the aliens after the game and they cleverly realised that, because uh, there was a Pope in the game, they... Had UFOs <laughs> flying to the Vatican, mm -hmm. 
because they knew that Italy wouldn't shoot them down. Not, it's when not just the, well. the, the Pope had been Airspace. talking to them since the very start of the game. He was given a way to communicate with them yeah. from yeah. turn one. The aliens said so, they specifically did it because they knew it would freak everyone out. I see how they did it. They flew a UFO straight down onto the Vatican, which meant it went through the Vatican airspace, and at no point was yeah. it within the jurisdiction <laughs> of Italy, and it meant that Italy couldn't shoot it down because the Vatican's airspace. Well, the DM said that they didn't even they didn't push the the UFO across to where it was going like they usually did when they placed UFOs they, they lowered it, it lowered it slowly wow. it's just so I guess that's one, of the, that's one of the things in the fact that actually yeah sure it was aliens potentially being peaceful and then watching the whole world kind of go up in arms and burn because we're stupid humans but at the same time mm. it wasn't exactly a perfect scenario of aliens potentially arriving peacefully because yeah. the people who were playing as the aliens and in charge of the whole game were purposefully throwing boxes of matches around <laughs> <laughs> which maybe wouldn't happen but it was it was nice that despite the fact that lots of people were being very human in bad ways and messing up and being selfish and just trying to get more for their country and get the best out of the situation mm -hmm. there was also like throughout the day periods where people were so confused about what to do and felt so like helpless in a way about how to progress that that we did notice a big trend across the entire game of then people doing their best to try and just resolve local problems. Yeah. It was almost like a sense of perspective. Of well, that's, being the thing. Like, that's where it becomes really model UN because once the aliens aren't necessarily a problem when they stopped landing, it was this funny thing of like, you know, I remember at the end of the game, there was a big cheer because um, the GM announced that like uh, Israel and Palestine mm -hmm. had resolved their difficulties, which is like just the most model UN yeah. thing. But I remember like, talking to the Prime Minister of Israel, he was really pissed off because he's like, he's like, have you seen the papers? And I was like, yeah, he's like, they they have they it's like a tiny like sideline. It's like I've like <laughs> this, is, this is my life's work. <laughs> we we spent ages and we've like, yeah, <laughs> there's this thing of being like, oh yeah, um Israel and Palestine, like they've they they're they're getting on now. Anyway, uh <laughs> Keza had that actually, because she spent like the first few turns setting up the Olympics which were hosted in Japan and until uh, later on and the, the aliens had been revealed and, and everyone kind of shifted focus. That was the entirety of her game, making sure that people attended <laughs> and making sure they had a nice time. And like, she put a lot of work into it. And then I think, I think the, 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 very, the, the news cycle that came out in which Japan has successful Olympics was on was also the one in which fucking Russia or someone had just announced that aliens exist and, and Kezu was a little bit heartbroken that she only had like a column on the left we had this big story we were talking about this the newspaper format totally wasn't the right one for them to use because you have these players trying to get information then also having time to write and lay out news stories yeah. which was silly Like, and actually what they should have had is just a massive projector with a Twitter style news feed mm -hmm. yeah. so that the journalists as soon as they found something out that they knew was true they just type it in and suddenly... Oh, then, not necessarily new is true. Like, well, they sure, think it's true. Sure. That's they it. could have, we could have the gutter press versus like, you know... You could leak secrets to the... It would be... It would be more that would actually be there. great if you had like two big projected boards. One which was a proper journalistic outlet which would only, only ever report oh, things if they had it yeah, multiple sure. sources. And then one which was like... Uh, what's that American thing oh, the National, National Enquirer, Enquirer. <laughs> like, which is basically just like anytime they hear anything tweet yeah <laughs> sure which would be so good because also that would solve the problem of players not even hearing about big world events yeah. which realistically they would know we all would know that if a UFO landed on the Vatican but we didn't find out for actual hours but if we had a rolling Twitter feed we'd know straight away you have on the Vatican hashtag, the <laughs> hashtag oh, oh shit yeah there was an a, a interesting part as well where the this ended up being because of there weren't enough people to cover as much news as was going on, but the two newspapers ended up joining forces um, like fairly early on in the game just because they needed to, it, to get enough writers to cover everything. I thought when I heard that shit, the aliens have taken over the press. They, like, <laughs> I immediately thought that, and I wanted to say it to you, but I. Oh, well, that's quite endemic. Neutral. That's quite endemic of the, just the mass paranoia, which yeah. is, I mean, like I wasn't even playing, and I was you're like, you basically you're trying to work out a puzzle, and it's that thing of being like. Um, we talked about it really briefly before, but it's that thing of when you're trying to solve a puzzle and it's like a, a game puzzle like this, there's usually like a GM nearby. And if you go, oh my God, what if it's this? Then usually there's somebody in charge of the game who like, you can just tell by the way they react to your suggestion mm -hmm. that you're completely you're on the wrong, wrong track. Yeah. Whereas because you don't get that, because you don't have people constantly watching you, you have theories that you then run with. And yeah. I had like so many mad theories throughout the day that, about what was going on. Some of which were actually really strong theories, I've got to say. Others which weren't. Um, <laughs> this is the arc thing again, isn't it? Man? But there were many periods throughout the day. <laughs> and the thing is that, yeah, like, 
<laughs> I'd say go and watch the videos because there were many periods in the day where I became 100% sure that I knew exactly what was happening. And it turned out later, maybe that wasn't The best right. thing was in the uh, the old Mega Game last year when um, the aliens spent some points on PSYOPs in Japan. And the result of that was Games Masters going up to you and going... Um, Oh, oh yeah, yeah, Matt, you've uh, you've heard rumors that uh, like, what was that? assassins have infiltrated your personal guard. Not only, and like, oh yeah, and there's corporate espionage and stuff, and like awful rumors that made you so scared. Because we again back then we didn't know the rules of the game. So you thought I'm you terrified. were going to be assassinated. I thought I was going to be assassinated. And I ended up investing a huge amount of money and time. I remember because you gave spies. that money to me, and I had to put spies in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> and we had some equally mad stuff in this game actually that I and I've just remembered that we won't talk about. But yeah. Do watch the videos uh, on shutupandsitdown.com. If you've not visited shutupandsitdown.com before, then you should have done because it's really good. And the videos will be hopefully very entertaining. And if you are interested in mega games, then yeah, mega game makers are the guys who do it. It's hugely popular. Is Watch um, the Skies an annual thing or is it? Uh, I don't know. They did the first one last year and they did a second one this year. Um, it's kind of they, exploded. They run a few every year. Okay. They run a bunch of stuff, but also like all over the world now. Like there are different people kind of syndicating it a little mm. bit. It's a bit ramshackle still. Uh, and often it sells out very quickly because they're very popular off the back of the videos, etc. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. Do, do pop over to the Mega Game site because you'll find tickets available for something probably around the UK. Yeah. And if not, if you're interested in actually running one of these things, or oh, maybe you're not in the UK at all, then uh, you can contact them and they'll sell you materials for running all kinds of different Mega Games. Yeah, but it's just something definitely worth keeping an eye on. But in the meantime, just watch us doing it quite badly. So badly. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to this Watch the Spies Skies special of Dark Souls and we'll continue next week with traditional stuff and thank you very much for joining us Mr. Chris Pratt of the Camera Land and <laughs> Mr. Land. Quentin Smith I'm going to go watch some pies now watch the pies watch the pies slip into your mouth thanks very much for watching <laughs> well, goodbye, listening. bye bye